are welcome. Now, I'll follow on Hungary's steps, although it should have been vice versa, no? Um, for historic reasons. For historic reasons. Um, well, we do witness, I guess, in, like in a lot of other places, the reversal of liberal democratic practices in Turkey as well. And I'm, I'm, I, unfortunately, I couldn't be here yesterday, and uh, I, so I don't know what was discussed about the state of the European Union. But I'm begin, as after, especially after uh, Mr. Bokros's presentation, uh, what came to my mind is, of course, uh, Steve Kotkin's thesis that uh, rather than seeing this as the victory of uh, civil society and the ever-burning flames of democracy, it was basically elite preferences to switch from a failed system to possibly successful, successful system uh, with them, of course, at the helm. And when that no longer really provided the goods, maybe they're coming back, especially in the environment that is de being defined by the crisis of 2007, 2008. Now, 2000, the crisis of 2008, uh, the inability of the Western countries, particularly Europe, to actually get away from it uh, fast and all that, is usually mentioned, but I think we should also not forget about the American experience, because the American experience, one way or another, touches us. And I don't think it is a negligible fact that faced with 9-11, the Bush administration has taken steps and implemented measures that violated the very spirit, if not the core of the American Constitution, a debacle that the Americans are finally now beginning to get out of, and with the NSA scandal, I think it proves that the American deep state is well and fairly alive. And that, of course, in itself, the NSA scandal has led to a deterioration of relations between the US and Europe as well at a time when this construct, this construct we call the West was in dire need of looking unified and sticking to its principles. So this is the context within which the new Turkey is, being, is, is shaping. Uh, since Ivan, I mean, I wasn't going to talk about that, but since Ivan did mention what, what the Erdogan difference is in politics, that Erdogan did indeed bring new social classes into the political realm, that uh, the Turkish economy compared to others had been more successful, at least in appearances, and that Turkish foreign policy had been much more vigorous than it had been uh, for a long time. What really distinguished the Erdogan experiment? To begin with, Erdogan, uh, current Turkey is not just Erdogan's product. That is, of course, what the Justice and Development Party and its leaders would like us to believe. But they themselves are a product of a very profound transformation in the Turkish economy and a profound transformation of Turkish society that was begun by the late President Turgut Özal back in 1980 when he was just a bureaucrat and the Prime Minister Demirel had finally had to have the courage of instigating this neoliberal opening in the Turkish economy. Therefore, what brought Erdogan to power was the inability of the Turkish elites, most notably the military, to actually deal with the end of the Cold War on the one hand, which pressured Turkey for opening up its system, and uh, for the unresponsiveness of the political system to the demands of the new more Islamically oriented elites on the one hand, and the masses that were flowing into urban areas from rural areas. Just briefly the figures. When the 1980 economic reforms were begun in Turkey in January of 1980, January 24, the Turkish population was 44 million. Of those, about 63% lived in rural areas and 27, 28% lived in urban areas. Today, Turkey's population is 77 million. And depending on who does the counting, 
anywhere between 72 and 75, 77% of the population live in urban areas. So this is a massive change of the demographic picture in this country in a span of about 35 years, okay? And that, of course, has its own force. And it is those people, the migrants, who, when everything else had failed, and the failure was symbolized by our crisis in 2001, when the Turkish economy shrank by 9.5%, that when everything else within the existing system failed and the system lost basically its legitimacy, they brought to power what a party that appeared to be the alternative, which also had, of course, ideological inclinations and ideological roots that ran counter to the official ideology of the Turkish Republic. Okay. But then, of course, once in power, Erdogan, who is, whether you like him or not, a masterful politician, probably the best of his generation, not just in Turkey, but anywhere in the world, made sure that that population was going to be increasingly more tied to him by many mechanisms of clientelism, patronage, and basically benefit distribution. Most notably, I mean, if, you, if, you, if I were forced to tell you one single reason as to why Erdogan had been successful winning basically seven votes, three general elections, three municipal elections, two referenda, I would say one thing the democratization of access to the healthcare system. That is an absolute, absolute good. And although the health system is probably going to go bankrupt sometime soon, it doesn't matter. The fact that you have access and that you've been able to get the service has proven durable in terms of the support that it got. So the, uh, so Erdogan in a way when I, when I just read Jan Werner Müller's piece in Foreign Affairs, I said, Orban or Erdogan? Basically the same thing. So he's not doing anything that is very different from what is happening here. I mean, I used to liken him, I used to compare him to Chavez. Uh, nowadays we call him uh, Berchatin. Berlusconi without the Bunga Bunga parties. Um, <laughs> Chavez and Putin, okay? <laughs> so anyway, but, I mean, he just, he just came out of municipal elections, which were billed as a national election. And, the, and in terms of, I mean, despite really pretty difficult conditions for anyone alive, he did get maybe not the 45.6 that they claim, depending on how you calculate things, but with clearly 43.5% of the vote, which rekindled his aspiration to become president and basically destroyed the political structure of the Turkish Republic by de facto establishing a presidential system. We'll see whether that will happen. So far, whatever he wanted, he got. And whatever people said he could not get, he did get, so we'll see. Now, since we t I'm supposed to talk about Erdogan's or t n new nationalism in Turkey, let's look at uh, the paradoxes of Erdogan's nationalism. Here's a man who broke one of the s most important taboos in the country politically and took a major step in opening up the Kurdish question to, pub, to a more generalized public debate. He did appoint people to go and talk to the devil incarnate, Mr. Öcalan, who is in jail in Imrala. And quite frankly, all those things that everyone else before said, oh my God, the, the, the sky would fall on our heads, the Turkish public didn't even blink. Honestly, I mean, yeah, I'm sure a lot of people were unhappy, but you know, it was basically, let's see the end of it. Now, the way things are going, it may not be as facile to, fit, to see the end of it, but he did make that opening, although he himself is more of a Turkish nationalist than a, than a let's say, non-nationalist cosmopolitan politician. 
And that, of course, what he wanted to rely on, and by the way, the results of the municipal elections suggest that he may not have been all that wrong, that the common ties of being Muslim and a very well-greased patronage system may actually undermine even Kurdish nationalism. Two days ago, and may, some of you may not have heard it yet, on the 23rd of April, which is the day, the anniversary of the opening of the Turkish parliament during the independence war, prior to the independence war, the parallel parliament in Ankara, Mr. Erdogan's office made public a statement on the, ninth, on the events of 1915. For those of you who are here, the events of, the of 1915, of course, refer to the basically physical elimination of the Armenian populations of Anatolia in the later stages of the Ottoman Empire. I don't really want to get into the labeling thing. If you want to call it a genocide, call it a genocide. If you want to call it ethnic cleansing, call it ethnic cleansing. It doesn't really matter. The most important thing about that letter, which was prepared by the bureaucrats, and Mr. Erdogan may have been convinced to publish it for expediency's sake, although doesn't believe a word in, that is written on it, I don't know. The fact of the matter is, a prime minister of the Turkish Republic acknowledged the elimination of the Armenians implicitly and offered his condolences to their children and their grandchildren. Again, I'm sure we will move away from this position, but that position has already been taken and it has been crossed. Now, it may be the dialectics of political expediency because my, Mr. Erdogan has delights, always finds it delightful to attack the Kemalist and the young Turk traditions of positivism, anti-Islamism and whatever. So that was another good occasion for him to say, you see, those were really the bad guys. Here I am, an Ottoman. I don't differentiate between my subjects. I treat them all equally well. If it was up to us, we would not have done this, okay? So, or it may be, you know, bring everybody's attention as well. Plus, of course, next year is the 100th anniversary. It's 2015. It's the 100th anniversary. All hell is going to break loose. And we have been until now defenseless because we have stuck to a position that is indefensible. With taking that preemptive move, you can at least say, hey, come, let's study it. So, but but it, it is very, I mean, this is at a time when Turkish nationalism is rising. The uh, relations to the West are not what they used to be. Okay? So, he may have done his, I mean, he's caught between a strictly nationalist outlook and a misconstrued Ottomanism, perhaps. But where we, were, we are moving towards, it appears, as a colleague of mine, Jenny White, calls Muslim nationalism. And yet another paradox is that this Muslim nationalism so much resembles, although the emphasis is on more on Muslim than on nationalism, the project of the military back in 1980 when they shoved down our throats the so-called Turkish Islamic synthesis. Okay, now let's get to Europe. Um, I don't know whether the tone was optimistic yesterday about Europe. I doubt it. <laughs> because if there is anything to be very optimistic about, tell me I could try to sell it back home. Uh, I'm wondering if it is just the 10th anniversary of the enlargement that we need to be discussing, but perhaps the 25th anniversary of the fall of the wall. And indeed, when I look at this, now, you know, this is a very interesting year, right? It's the 100th year of the beginning of the First World War, the 75th year of the beginning of the Second World War, a 25th year of the beginning of, of the end of the Cold War, 10th year of enlargement, God knows what else. Uh, well, the thing, the thing is, what are we settling? In the Middle East, we are now undoing the results of the First World War. By the way, the results of the First World War in Europe had been undone in 1989 with the Yugoslav dissolution. 
So when I look as a Turk to what had happened 25 years ago in Yugoslavia and what is happening today starting with Iraq and Syria and in Iraq, in their greatness the Americans did something that they probably didn't even think they were doing. Uh, what they've done is, what they've done is in the, in the, in those parts of the of Europe which were which remained more cosmopolitan, more heterogeneous, parts of the Austrian-Hungarian and Ottoman Empire, in Europe, homogenization had been completed, I suppose, by and large, and that has now gone all the way to the Middle East. The greatest accomplishment, quote unquote, of George W. Bush, a self-proclaimed reborn Christian, is the elimination of Christianity in Iraq and possible erosion of Christianity in Syria. Because what, and, and the sectarian war that we're witnessing, that we have witnessed in Iraq and we're witnessing today, although it is being used as part of the geopolitical struggle between the Saudis and the Iranians on the one hand, maybe to the Turks as well, uh, has, also, has also homogenized regions, cities, neighborhoods. When the Americans took their war to Iraq in 2003, it is estimated that there were about a million mixed marriages in Iraq. There were plenty of mixed neighborhoods. There are none now left. There are no, as I said, no Christians left in the Arab part of Iraq. Those Christians who have stayed in the territories of Iraq are now in Iraqi Kurdistan. Okay. So this is, if you will, the context. And uh, as a consequence, the Turks are also responding to the revisionist uh, uh, period in the, for the end of the First World War. And there are relations with the West, the, our desti the selected destination 200 years ago, are becoming, uh, first of all, rather um, sour. And on the other hand, if I were giving this talk two years ago, I would have said, well, we're replacing the West with this. Well, this has also disappeared as Turkish policy in the Middle East has also, at least for the moment, collapsed. So let's get to the enlargement and, uh, and, and, and the relations between Europe and Turkey. Now, find one final point on the other, and it's always the Euro that is being blamed and probably rightly for the debacle, I should cut it. I haven't begun. <laughs> this, this is why I think <laughs> this is the problem with the former empire. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't an imperial thing I was trying to pick in context. Um, <laughs> but maybe it is, it is the question that needs to be raised is whether the question that as it was formulated back in the beginning of the 1990s was the right way of formulating the question of what next with Europe. I'm, I'm, it's not being against enlargement, but how to put it. Okay, then. Um, I think the Turkish government did try uh, the membership thing in good faith, but admission of Cyprus 10 years ago was morally wrong, and it proved to be, in my view, politically even wronger. Now, for those who never wanted to see the face of Turkey in the European Union, obviously this wasn't wrong, but I think in a broader strategic sense, uh, for a very, maybe very different kind of European project, it was indeed a mistake. Because you may not like Turkey, you may not like Turks, but just be, think about expediency and try to look at the map, imagine the map without Turkey on it. You'll be neighbors with Iran, which will be a nice country. <laughs> Syria, Iraq, Lebanon, Israel, um, and basically without, however faulty the Turkish politics may be today, without the mediating, facilitating role that Turkey at its worst actually plays. Not to mention an economy that will continue to grow, the demographic factors that will help, the skilled workforce that is there, and, and, and all sorts of other things. Anyway. Referenda basically, and, I, and obviously people like me didn't want to acknowledge it at the time in 2005, the Dutch and the French referenda basically killed any, any hope for Turkish admission anytime soon. Then came the suspension of articles for negotiations. 
the EU reneged on its commitments, and the duplicity which defined Turkish-European relations forever had begun anew. Then the economic crisis hit, EU turns inwards, and the Turks can say, ha ha, who needs whom more? Now, it was a bit of an arrog imperial arrogance, obviously, but, uh, and, uh, and the EU, by the way, for reasons that I do not fully understand, treated Turkey with kid gloves as we took our cue from Orban and moved in the bad direction of authoritarianism. So rising self-confidence of Turkey as the economic crisis, as the prime minister called it, goes tangent, tangent on Turkey. We lost 5.5% of, uh, of income in 2009 and rebounded with 9.5% growth in 2010, another 9% growth in 2011, and so on and on. Now, of course, we're back to 25 to 3%. There was also the growing prominence in the Middle East as the American war turned into a debacle and imperial or pan-Islamist aspirations were really rekindled. Uh, and, uh, and that really fed into what, what, as I said, Jenny White called Muslim nationalism. I have to go uh, telegraphically since the chair who, is, who comes from a very undemocratic country forces me to. <laughs> But that's the only way to be a chair, yeah. Um, so we have a paradoxical and perhaps very unhealthy psychological relations to the EU. We have both resentment and recognition that the EU framework, whether or not we ever hope to be a member, whether or not we like the Europeans, that framework is the only framework within which we can actually be successful. That doesn't project itself in election results but it projects itself in poll after poll for the last 25 years. And I'll cut it there with one last point, uh, word. <laughs> Since 1996, those who do not want Turkey's membership in the European Union never exceeded 30% of the population. In the meantime, the population has probably increased by about 10 or 12 million. Those who want EU membership now are down to about 40%, but those in between don't go to the dark side. They go to the gray side. Because at the end of the day, the reason why Turks back in the mid-1990s wanted and wanted it so badly, the European Union membership, was not just a whim. Because we thought that left to our own devices without a proper framework, we will slide back to our original organizing principles, which is where we're going now. Finally, on foreign policy. What role for Europe in Turkey's foreign policy? What role for NATO in the future, by the way? What, I mean, does the United States really care about the Ukraine? Huh? Oh yeah, I heard John Kerry last night as I arrived, you know, more oligarchs will be punished. They cannot go and have champagne with their mistresses in I don't know which hotel. Uh, Russia may not have much of a future in what it does. I take my clues from Ivan's uh, analysis. But lo looking at it from a Turkish perspective, where do you go? Do you follow the Western trend when there is, where there is no unity? Or do you try to make sure that you don't break your relations with Russia, which is both a big market your main supplier of energy, and certainly your very close neighbor in the Black Sea, which is turning very rapidly into a Russian lake. I'll leave it at that.